Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Good to see you. It's been a couple of weeks, I guess. Yeah, a couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks uh, for joining in those online, Shiv Kumar, Samuel, Chira. Good to see you. Um, <clears throat> I hope you can hear me through the fans' noise, but uh, I think I'll have to speak at this volume <laughs> for. All right, great. Uh, let's pray and we'll get. Okay. Father, we thank you uh, for this day. We, Lord, we humble ourselves before you. Um, we honor you. We love you, Jesus, for everything that you do in our lives. Lord, I pray for the uh, for the rest of this day. Uh, Lord, we ask of you to come and have your way. Uh, continue to pour out your wisdom, your knowledge, and your understanding, even as we uh, learn about your word from your word, Holy Spirit. Um, help us to be sensitive to the leading of your voice, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, right. So the course name is uh, Holiness, uh, BC209. Um, we started off this course uh, by understanding the holiness of God, right? Uh, who he is and how beautiful, how wonderful he is, how magnificent and how... Uh, he is holy, that he is set apart, that there is no one like him, isn't it? Uh, we can try and grasp uh, his holiness, and there's only so much we can understand. Um, and also, when we declare that he is beautiful, the beauty of the Lord, worship the Lord, and the beauty of his holiness, we are declaring that he is holy, right? Uh, he is wonderful, there is no one like him. And so that's section one. Right? Section 1 is all about understanding His holiness and how this holy God is not just satisfied being holy. I uh, said, okay, I'm holy. Uh, no, but then He desires His children, right? you and me, uh, you know, to, to become like Him. Right? And that is His desire for you and me. He, he's just not sitting up there in His throne saying, yes, I like my place, my heaven. My throne room is amazing. My cherubim, the seraphims are all there. They're worshiping me. I am holy. I know that. Uh, you know, there's a rainbow in, encircling my throne. This is so awesome. No, he's just not satisfied with that. He desires for his children to begin to look more like him, right? And so now, the really, the ball is in our court, per se, right? It's it's up to us to make that choice to begin to look like him, to walk like him, to talk like him, because he, through his son, Jesus, has made himself available, right, for us to become like him, right? The blood is there. The blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross is available for you and for me. Um, the choice is, again, is up to us. What do we want to make of it? We can either reject uh, the sacrifice of Jesus, or accept him and make him our righteousness, right? Because our righteousness are nothing but filthy rags, right? We don't attain justification or salvation with our works, right? We don't have to hit ourselves with lashes. We don't have to climb up a thousand step to attain salvation or to be justified. Are you following, right? Um, so this holy God has made himself available for us to step into and taste of His holiness. And all of that is expressed by faith. Right? Uh, Romans says we are justified by faith. Right? We are justified by faith. We are sanctified. So in sanctification, another thing that we learned was sanctification is two folds. One is the positional truth of sanctification. The other one is the it's a progressive uh, sanctification, right? So when I say two folds, one is positional means as the, the minute, the moment I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I am justified. I'm also sanctified. That means I am legally, my legal position before God is changed. I'm going from a sinner. I'm saved from the state of sin to a saint or a believer, right? However, now, because I am, my legal position is changed, like, again, so let's say you've committed uh, um, a crime, 
um, this, right, a, a murder of some sort. Now, you have been declared innocent, right? That means your legal position is changed from guilty to innocent, isn't it? And now you continue to live out that innocence by not committing another crime. Yes, so that's what's called as progressive sanctification, right? Um, so we learned that it's all been made available to us from Ephesians 2, Romans 5, Romans chapter 4, verse 25. All of that uh, talks about how we are justified by faith, right? And Romans chapter 4, verse 25 especially says that Jesus rose from the dead only after we were justified. Romans 4.25, that's the last verse of that chapter. Right? So that is very powerful. Okay, so that's what that's all of that is section one. So I, I want you to bear with me because we're just going to go through like a, a quick recap of everything that we've covered so far. Um yeah, is that okay? Are you all with me? Okay. Uh, Romans 4.25 is, is a very important and a very powerful uh, chapter because that verse leads us into chapter 5. And chapter 5 verse 1 begins by saying that you have been justified by faith. And then Romans 4.25, we know that Jesus did not rise up. He was not resurrected until we were justified. Do we do we understand the, the intensity and the gravity of that? of that resurrection is key to our christian doctrine and theology without resurrection nothing of what we do is yeah it's just baseless we don't have uh, you know we don't have the resurrection because we have the new testament we have the new testament because of the resurrection I said again, we don't have the resurrection because we have the New Testament. Okay, we have the New Testament because of the resurrection. And then in John 11, 25, we see that Jesus says that I am the resurrection and the life. So that means resurrection is not just an event that happened in history, which can be proved on evidence. Which is true. Resurrection is also an event that happened, which cannot, which can be proved by evidences that is available, right? Because of the eyewitnesses, five hundred eyewitnesses that saw Jesus, and people testify, right? Um, so those are all there. But resurrection is a person. Life is a person. That's why Jesus says, "I am the resurrection and the life." He is not talking about resurrection as an event. Are you with me? So all of this to say is this holy God. Has made himself available to you and to me to walk in his righteousness. Are you with me? Right? And so everything that we studied about the holiness of God, that he's thrice holy, uh, you know, his name is holy, all of this is so that you and I, as his children, right, as sons and daughters of, of Jesus, can step in and walk in that same uh, life that Jesus has made available to us. Right? Jesus didn't die on the cross so that you and I can have a dress code. Which we have reduced it to. Yeah? Um, and so, okay, so that's where we are. At, and maybe in, in, in the previous session, uh, the last session that we discussed was, we started with the section 2, which is uh, called for repentance right repentance recovery and restoration right this is like the passing section to the final section which is overcoming the flesh so we looked at four chapters in the previous class um so which is in the section of repentance recovery and restoration the three r's r3 or whatever you want to call it okay what is it repentance say it with me repentance recovery and restoration right all right so uh we began by looking that jesus preached repentance right his famous message was that mark 1 15 uh, the time is fulfilled that the kingdom of god is at hand repent and believe in the gospel 
So we began by looking at that. So Jesus preached repentance. John the Baptist preached repentance. And then we... So what is the meaning of repentance? Or what is the Greek word for repentance? That we learned. In chapter 2 of second section, it's metanoia. It simply means to think differently. Okay, guys, see, th these are all like... Though we are not learning the entire language of Hebrew or Greek, but some crucial words which you will be and be using this a lot as leaders, as pastors, etc. Uh, these are crucial words that you have to remember. Okay, it's it, there's no other choice. Uh, it's uh, you ha you have to make it a choice to remember. Uh, in other words, memorize it and record it, keep it, store it, and no. Okay, so repentance in Greek means metanoia now why is it important to know the greek language because it's it's in the language that it was written in right and the new testament most of it was written in greek right so um and why again now why is it important to when you do word studies like that this is just a side or a footnote is for example when we use the word love in english or any language in um in let's say hindi or hindi we say what pyar another Another word for love in Hindi? It's what it is, right? Okay, so um, now again in English, we have one word for love, isn't it? Um, now we use that one word to express a love for anything, right? I love pizza, I love dosa, I love coffee, I love chai, I love to sleep, I love MS Dhoni. Hmm? Hmm. Tala. Oh. <laughs> uh, I love this, I love that, uh, etc. Right? I love my father, I love my mother, I love my brother, I, uh, you know, I love her, I love my wife, etc. etc. But again, in Greek, um, in ancient Greek, there are four different words for love. Right? In modern Greek, they've added two more words. There are six Greek words for love. So each of those words express or uh, define for a certain kind of a love. And one of the words is agape, which is God's kind of a love. You understand what I'm saying? So all of this and just remembering crucial words, very important words, uh, is significant in us understanding the word of God and also teaching the word of God, right? So and for the, one of the words there for repentance is metanoia, okay, which means thinking differently. So to, to repent it simply means that our thinking has to change. Now, if our thinking changes, uh, see, in again, going through the progression in the book of Romans from chapter 5. Chapter 5, it says that we have been justified by faith. Chapter 6 says that you have, uh, you know, uh, because you've been justified by faith, don't continue to live in sin because you need to know you are dead in sin. Okay, and then chapter 7 says, okay, no matter how much you try in, by yourself, you can't die, die to your fleshly desires. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. And then Romans chapter 8 says, encourages us to walk in the Holy Spirit. And the highlight or the crescendo of this Paul's message in the first 11 chapters is concluded in chapter 12 of Romans. Then he says, okay, now therefore... Brethren, I urge you by the mercies of God to offer yourself up as living sacrifices. Don't be conformed, patterns of the world, but be transformed. There you go. So this whole, from chapter 1 to chapter 11, Paul, in, in many ways, he's talking about the mercies of God. That's why in chapter 12, he starts off by saying, therefore. So therefore, that therefore in chapter 12 is like one big conclusion to the first 11 chapters where he's talking about the mercies of God. So we've been justified because of the mercies of God. We can live a holy life because of the mercy of God in, in many ways, right? Um, so, and, and then now that we know that repentance or metanoia simply means think differently, uh, is if your thinking changes, Everything else, every other aspect of your life is changed. Are you with me? Right? And so now, before you gave your life to Christ, you were a drug addict, you were an alcoholic, uh, you were using abusive language, etc. All of that. Uh, you were watching 
filth, now there's a change because you've given your life to God. Right? All of the every aspect of your life that was worldly has to change, transform. We cannot continue to be conformed to the ways of the world, but we have to transform. And it begins with your thinking. Right? Um, are you are you all following? Okay. <laughs> um, so in chapter four of the second section, which we looked at, it's titled, uh, it's in the part two of the PDF. Okay, repentance, grace, and forgiveness. That's okay. You, you all know where I am, right? Part two, which is chapter four in uh, of the PDF. Um, we began by looking at: Do believers need to repent? The answer is an emphatic yes. <laughs> okay, um, and then we concluded that section by looking at uh, the letters from uh, letters to the churches in um, Revelation. Right, it all it's all talking about uh, repentance. How the Lord's message to uh, seven churches is about repentance. Okay, uh, it's interesting that we saw that New Testament begins with the word or message of repentance to everyone, to the Gentiles, because there were no Christians back then. It's to the Jews and the Gentiles, right? And then in Revelation, we see finally that the message is now to the churches. So the question again comes back, or the answer to the question, should Christians repent or should churches repent, is an emphatic yes. Are you all with me? Okay, now as we continue with uh, the remainder of the um, the course, we'll see why it's important for the churches also to uh, repent, okay, eventually. Uh, are you all with me? Are you all following? Okay, uh, how about you guys online? Uh, you all, all good? Uh, okay, awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Prabhu. Okay, um, so I, I again, I really hope that it's uh, you, you're able to absorb all this material or this content and uh, not just view it as a content, but it's ministering to your your spirit, and that you're able to um, you know just understand the intensity of the message of repentance because um, the churches don't preach this enough. It's not a very uh, popular topic. Repent, right? It, it seem it's it's viewed as a very old school, unpopular kind of a thing. Um, but it's a nevertheless, it's an important message. Okay. So we look at chapter five. We'll begin there. Uh, all sins, great and small. So we're taking a little bit of a diversion. Um, does God differentiate between sins, or all these e equally detestable in God's eyes, leading to the same destination? Um, uh, the answer is again very simply yes. Okay, um, be it lust or adultery right in the old testament the action of adultery was condemned in the new testament the thought right is condemned it's it's the same thing right um hate in the new testament is spoken of as the same as an action of murder in the old testament right um you can't say I hate my brother, and then continue to, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Pride or sexual immorality, um, sowing disunity or idolatry, um, speaking lies or killing the innocent. You, you, do you see the comparison there? Killing the innocent. That's what most of the world is fighting for now, isn't it? Innocent people, innocent children are being killed or in, in the war. Abortion is what? Killing the innocent. Right? That is like, I'm, you know, if, if I were to ask that question across the room, uh, you know, if I say, okay, is abortion wrong? Hopefully everybody would say, yes, it is. 
uh, and then we can get into a, like a discussion about it later. But that is this. It, it's a, it is as wrong as, it, as sorry lying is as wrong as killing the innocent. And the Bible calls devil as the father of lies. Ooh. But for some of us Christians, lying is so natural, like second nature. And then we want to sugarcoat it with white lies. You know, it's... Uh... <laughs> See, we can have a debate about all of that, but you know the general gist of how you know, and and the scriptures mentioned there. You know, Proverbs six is is has to be one of my favorite passages. Proverbs chapter six, verse sixteen to nineteen. Uh, it starts off by saying, "These are the seven things that the Lord detests, and the six He hates." When Bible is using strong words like that, we need to sit from from like this. We need to go like, okay, <laughs> be attentive. The Lord hates? Okay. You know, in living, uh, living a holy life or a repented lifestyle, there is an element of hate towards sin that you need to develop. That we as Christians need to develop a hate towards sin. Right? Um, so, Isaiah, he sees the holiness of God and then he says, Woe unto me, for I am a man of unclean lips. Right, there's there's a, a an awakening, so to speak, or a revelation, uh, saying, or a realization of who you are, and then that is absolutely detestable to you because it is detestable to God. First on that list is what haughty eyes or pride, in Proverbs chapter six verse sixteen. The number one thing on the list. Is pride. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay. So, uh, just continuing from the notes, there it says: so we we must treat all sin with equal disdain. We must treat all sin with equal disdain okay now i remember i think almost 5 years ago when uh, the supreme court passed the section something um, that gave license for uh, it's i think it agreed by saying that it's okay to be a homosexual of some sort in in india that was a big thing and that was like the hot topic among christians uh, say, oh, you know, Supreme Court has passed this. Supreme Court has said this is okay. And uh, suddenly the church came alive. Uh, <laughs> uh, see, the world is going to be the world. Right? The world is going to be the world. Like, they, the world doesn't care about like the, the biblical values or principles or holiness for that matter. Right? Um, but the Christians also shouldn't be taken by surprise, saying, okay, oh my gosh, now sexual immorality, homosexuality, and all of this. It's the same as killing the innocent or lying or pride or hate. thing. So we treat all sin with equal disdain. Sin is sin. There's no negotiating with sin. This is better, that is better. <laughs> okay, um, so whether these sins are uh, sins of the in, uh, inner person like lust, hate, pride, etc., or sins we may consider small, like sowing disunity or telling lies, or sins that we may consider as big, like adultery, murder, sexual immorality, idolatry, or killing the innocent. All sin is detested by God. Right? And Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse one, we see. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness it's not just some filthiness but all filthiness okay now we look at more at second corinthians chapter 7 it's uh, it's a very important chapter in terms of repentance okay now in second corinthians chapter 7 uh, or in chapter 7 yeah paul has kind of toned down his harshness 
uh, he's saying he's he's he actually begins to be very appreciative of the church in Corinth in the, his second letter because in his first letter Paul absolutely destroys Corinthians. <laughs> he's very harsh in his first letter, right? In uh, especially in chapter five, you see uh, you know uh, away from all unrighteousness, uh, you know, and all of that. But anyways, we'll we'll get to that. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. But Second Corinthians chapter seven. Verse 1. Hit the record button, memorize it. This was, therefore, having these promises, uh, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness, right? Of the flesh and spirit. There's a distinction. Okay, filthiness of the flesh. That means there are filthiness associated with spirit and filthiness associated with the flesh. Okay, so perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So now again, we've begun to understand that all sins, great and small, it's it's the same thing. There is no distinction or you know big small thing. So now we've understand understood the weight of uh, the message of repentance. Jesus preached that. John the Baptist preached it. It began by preaching repentance to the Gentiles and the Jews. And then finally in Revelation, we see that it's being preached to the churches. Um, and then in chapter 6, we see that, so what leads a person to repentance? All right Now, have you guys repented in your life? Yes? Yeah, it's okay to say yes. If, if you haven't, it's okay. I'm not going to chase you out. Okay. It's like, no, sir, I didn't. Yeah, I'll pray for you. Uh -huh. Multiple times. Multiple times a day also sometimes. <laughs> uh, especially Bangalore traffic. Like, hey, watch. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. sorry. <laughs> right. Uh... <laughs> Okay, so uh, let me just ask you this uh, question, right? Uh, what has caused you to repent in the past? Like, you remember, you say that you repented, right? What was, uh, why did you repent or what made you repent? What caused you to repent? Anyone? See, rather? Give. She's close. Uh, give, give. Um, yeah, ladies first. When we feel like it's uh, something God doesn't like, and uh, like when we know the word of God or truth, and uh, we know all of that, that is fine. Is but you tell me what, yeah, what caused like, you to repent. I, I I thought that it's not right in God's eyes. It's not right in and, God's uh, eyes. Okay. I should not do this thing. Whatever okay. I've done, it's okay. wrong. That's what it's so it's not right in God's eyes. So there was some kind of a realization there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Breathe. Uh, a conviction inside that I was hurting God and God was still asking to come back. It's more like the Holy Spirit convicting me that like, he is being good to you. I can't do this to him. He has been good to me. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, Nikhil. So, Those online, feel free to just type in your answers. Uh, so you before, uh, like, when I accepted Jesus Christ all, so it was just for normal for me. It was just normal for me. Like, uh, uh, we started praising, worship, all things prayer. But after that, uh, when I started learning, so when I started uh, reading Bible, so it was coming in my... Uh, Heart, like whatever I'm doing, that's not right. What I was doing and still I'm doing, that's not right. So I should ask God for this forgiveness because I read this, this is in, this is in, this is in all things. Mm. So I read, when I read that things, so I uh, thought I have to repent because I have done all things, this is wrong. Whatever is like, uh, whatever things, like what I done, so that's all wrong thing. So I have to repent to God. Awesome. So yeah. Thanks, Nicholas. Okay. So we had that it is not right in God's eyes. That means his principle, his standards, his goodness, 
um, his word. Okay. Uh, for me, like the repentance time when I first like um, repenting time is the first time I got the encounter with God. Oh. Before I was like I wrote in my diary, I was lost after I found like um, it was like kind of supernatural experience and Holy Spirit uh, like in the scripture we can say like for the right like Holy Spirit teach right and wrong and right. I felt like I remember what are the things I did against the God mm. and like from my heart is not from my mind or what like from my heart is start saying like God I will live for you mm. so that is a experience. so but what caused you to do that is a love of God love to God what Jesus did for me and uh -huh. I'm doing against Jesus right I felt barren right awesome thank you Francis thanks I repented when I realized I'm not living the actual right life hmm. uh, being a person who knows uh, uh, how to obey God but yeah uh, when I realized when I'm not being the correct person, hmm. not a person. That's when right. I yeah. Yeah. When I'm not, when I realized that I'm not living a proper life, hmm. being knowing that I have to live in certain way. They are kind of similar to what Sri Radha was also sharing. Yeah. Okay. Separation. Right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah. So repentance happened, and um, and I think you know you all shared that you know it happens multiple times. Um, okay. Jachin says, um, "God loves me in spite of knowing my tendency to fall for sin." Um, the verse Christ died for me while I was a sinner. Uh, he always pursued me and never condemned me for my sin, but gave me my everything. I chose repentance as my lifestyle. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Awesome. Yes. Um, yeah, I think for most of us, it is that it is uh, the love of God is like the basis of it, right? Uh, for some, it is the love of God. For some, uh, and it is the fear of God, like okay, it's not good in you know God's eyes, you know um, that that thing is there, right? That um, intrinsic uh, fear of of who He is um, and the values that's been instilled uh, and all that. Um, but for most of them, it is the love of God. In that love of God, you encounter His grace, His mercy, you know. Uh, and I'm sure all of us have pages of stories of the times that you know you've repented that you've encountered his grace his love uh, and and all of that right and uh, um yeah and and i i remember there was this time um so i've repented many times as well um there's so many things but one one of the instances was uh 2005 there was a youth camp and uh, i was standing standing way back in the hall and the worship was going on and uh, there was a song by Delirious. It's called Majesty. Uh, your grace has found me just as I am. You've heard that song, Empty Handed But Alive in Your Hands. Um, I remember the worship leader was uh, repeating the chorus. And it was about the fifth time when we sang that chorus, it hit me. Like, you know, until then, it's like I was not engaged. I was, I was singing the song, like, you know, uh, but not really engaged with the lyrics and i think that's why sometimes repetition is good you know like you mean it you know it's like because you don't know when it's going to hit you uh, that doesn't mean you keep singing the same thing you know it's a, okay till kingdom come but no it's uh it took me fifth time to be engaged with the thing okay someone else could have been engaged in the first time they sang the song but it was i remember the fifth time when i said okay your grace has found me just as I am. And only I knew how I was. And then empty-handed, 
but I live in your hands. That means I didn't bring anything to the table. I, I didn't bring anything. I didn't do anything so that I could be found. But your grace found me. And so that hit me like, you know, and I will never forget that moment. And uh, it is in the same hall where APC East meets Whitefield Church. <laughs> yeah, it's in the very same hall. In 2005, I, uh, I think I was an 18 year old back then. But anyways, so uh, some of the points that in this chapter we will look at is what leads a person to repentance, just like how most of you have shared. One is good, God's goodness leads to repentance. Right, Romans chapter 2 verse 4 as it says, do you or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Right? Goodness of God leads us to repentance or it should lead us to repentance. It's not just a wonderful song. It's like, your goodness is running after, is running after. Oh, wow, what an amazing song. You know, it's like, whoa, God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. His goodness is running after me. All my life, you have been faithful. You know, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a wonderful thing to rejoice and celebrate about His goodness. But at the same time, it should lead us to repentance and realization of who we are and who He is. Yes? Okay, so God is good and that should lead us to repentance. And second thing is the works and miracles of God often leads us to repentance. Often, not always. I mean, there's, you know, um, so what is it? You know, when Jesus performed miracles in Matthew chapter 11, verse 20, for example, it says, then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done. Think of all the cities. Some, name me some of the cities that Jesus did mighty works. Uh, Bangalore, Chennai, uh, <laughs> Capernaum, Galilee, Bethany, okay, etc. So he's saying it came at, there came a time that in all the cities where he performed this mighty works, it simply means miracles, signs, and wonders. Why, why did he begin to rebuke them? Because they did not repent. So it is an element, there's, what it's saying is that the signs and wonders, miracles, healings, and all of that, sometimes it leads people to repentance. Some of them experience miracles and then just go back and continue living their old life. Yes or no? Right, they experience miracle. God just healed them miraculously. You know all these creative miracles, whatnot. This person did not have a kneecap. God miraculously gave a kneecap. Uh, you know, and then after encountering a something like that, go back and you know uh, li live uh, the same old life that they were living in. But it is also possible that this person gives their life to Jesus. Are you with me? So the first thing is the goodness of God, the miracles of God that uh, often leads us to repentance. Um, you know this wonderful uh, story in Luke chapter 5 um, where Jesus tells Peter about the miracle of the fish basically, right? It says uh, Peter has tried catching fish all night um, and uh, Jesus comes and asks, have you <laughs> not caught any fish? He's like, no. Uh, why don't you cast the net on the other side? Uh, Peter says something interesting. Uh, you know, we've been doing this all night, uh, but because you say so, because of at your word, I'm going to take you at your word, and I'm going to cast it on the other side. Right? Um, and it is the same Peter in his epistle later, he says, cast your burdens unto Jesus. He's simply saying, cast... Yeah, don't cast it on you know the same side that you've been casting. Try, try Jesus. Okay, and then when the miracle actually happens, Peter repents. He repents, and that's the story in Luke chapter five, verse one to eleven. After this great catch of fish, he said, "Like Lord, I repent. I am a sinner. Away from me. I'm not worthy." You're following, right? So that's another instance where uh, miracles of God often leads us to repentance. Yeah, you have a question. Yes. Uh, 
Pastor, like uh, some of these uh, prosperity preachers and all, they they just uh, uh, putting this term as a primary thing, like miracles, which leads us to repentance. Like uh, like the they they'll say like there are many people who got saved or who came to Jesus because of miracles. But but on the other side, if we see, uh, they did not commit uh, in in other if we see John also after the first miracle. Uh, after the first miracle of Jesus Christ, huh. the people did not commit themselves to Jesus. Yes, it's just they saw the miracles that they came and yes. they enjoyed in the event. Yes. But is it okay that that we can put this term as primary the miracles or the things? Is it put this term as miracles huh. as the thing to just come to Jesus? It leads to Jesus or with repentance, or or uh, or we have to believe in 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 Christ what He is, what He made for us. Yeah, so let's look at the life of, let, sorry, let's look at the life of Jesus, right? Now, from Matthew chapter 4 onwards, in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, that's where this thing of Jesus performing miracles, signs and wonders begins, healing the sick, raising the dead, you know, and he was moved with compassion, he was moved with compassion, he was moved with compassion, time and time again, right? And now, that was, now, in the if you remember the course, uh, um, he, ministering, healing and deliverance, Right, ministering healing and deliverance uh, when miracles act one of the points if you remember is acts as a signpost that points towards God you remember that point okay I hope you do right uh, and so and another point that I remember from that course is that miracles uh, gather uh, catches people's attention good and bad it caught the attentions of the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. It also got the attention of the people from all across the town and the cities. So they came, right? Um, so when when the woman with the issue of the blood, uh, when she touched the hem of his garment and when she got healed, okay, later, other people from other cities tried to do the same. Why? Right? Because they heard that this happened with this person. Are you with me? And so... Miracle signs and wonders do attract people to Christ. So now if I'm ministering healing and deliverance, the fundamental or the foundation of it is I can't get glory. I should not take the glory. I should immediately point him to Jesus. And that is the message of repentance as well. John the Baptist, who preached about repentance, he always pointed people towards Jesus, his own disciples towards Jesus, to into a point and say, I am not worthy to even untie his sandals. And so, yeah, miracle signs and healing, you, for example, you go, we do street evangelism, and you go and ask for a person, is there anything I can pray for you? Or if you move in the prophetic and the Holy Spirit says, okay, this person's back has been hurting, and you go with, the, with word of knowledge and say, hey, is everything okay with your back? Can I pray for you? Okay, and then the person gets healed. And now you just have open window to introduce Jesus to them and say, it's not me who did this. Jesus healed you. Would you like to know more about Jesus? Are you with me? Right? And so, yeah, I'm all for it. You know, We should always remember that, that we, in anything we do, we don't take the credit at all. We, we dare not take any credit. Say, okay. okay uh, Nina says repentance uh, happens out of sorrow for sin. Yes, uh, Nina, and that I have done or thought something which is against His ways, in the face of unconditional love, and the Holy Spirit convicts me and causes me to repent. Yes, true. Um, and I think uh, you know we'll uh, that point that you made happens out of sorrow is explained uh, in detail in Second uh, Corinthians chapter seven. Okay, that's what we'll look at, okay, uh, in just a moment. But thank you for sharing that. Um, actually, that's the third point. You know, godly sorrow leads to repentance. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. And uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9 to 10. We, I just mentioned that 2 Corinthians chapter 7 is a very crucial chapter in, in the topic of repentance. Right? Now, he, Paul is writing here, Now I rejoice... Not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. 
okay for you were made sorry in a godly manner that's exactly what you expressed it's like lord i i'm i feel bad or like i'm i'm sorry for what i have done right uh, because this is your standard and therefore i repent and this the same paul in first corinthians is just belting the people of corinthians like the church of corinthians right uh, put away from you that sinful person cast away what are you doing right and then in the second letter of the corinthians he is much more appreciative it's like i rejoice not that you felt sorry but that's that you know that godly sorrow led you to repentance are you with me okay so verse 10 of second corinthians chapter 7 it says for godly sorrow produces repentance highlighted in different colors and keep okay <laughs> all these scriptures we won't make a frame and stick it you know but it's so important for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation uh not to be regretted but the sorrow of the world produces uh death sorry mm ungodly sorrow uh yeah yeah see the in it see we are made in the image of god in other words is we are made in the likeness of god right every human being we are all made in the likeness of god what does it mean to be made in the likeness of god imago deo greek word okay so that means we all have the capacity to love yes or no we all have the capacity to forgive right we all have the capacity to be patient we have the capacity to be kind we have the capacity to be generous right are you following what i'm saying right and so that means it's it's an innate intrinsic thing in every human being to feel sorry you don't have to be a christian to feel sorry right but then christian or godly kind of a sorry a sorrow leads us to repentance leads us to him are you with me so correct yeah so yeah so we can feel so what prince is saying is that if we, it is possible that we feel sorry and too guilty and not go towards god yeah 100% absolutely yeah and that the perfect example is what judas and peter judas and peter isn't it and so see you can feel no godly sorrow slash um, mourning or feeling sad morning right not morning morning right um it can lead us to two places now in mark chapter 16 the last chapter it's when uh, mary magdalene comes and tells the disciples that i have seen jesus now it starts off by saying that the disciples were mourning at their place mourning about the death of jesus jesus has left them right they were all mourning that's the last chapter you can see that and when mary went and told them while they were mourning they said they did not believe okay so godly sorrow or mourning can lead you to two places it can lead you towards unbelief that means away from god or it can lead you to the comforter are you with me so that's the only two results that can um that can happen and so um yeah we'll kind of conclude with this last point um the fourth point or letter d says god grants repentance god grants repentance okay so this is the letter paul is writing to timothy in second timothy chapter 2 verse 24 26 he's saying and the servant of the lord must not quarrel but be gentle to all able to teach patient in humility correcting those who were in position uh and if god perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth verse 26 and that they may come to their senses 
<laughs> and escape the snare of the devil. So this is basically talking about those people who are who are not aware that they are under the snare of the devil. Right? That means that they are committing doing something wrong, but they haven't realized it or they don't realize it that they are under the attack of the devil. So as a leader or as a pastor, Timothy is leading a church there, right? He's saying, okay, hey, when you realize that this certain individual is going through something like this, okay, be gentle, be kind uh, in a way so that they will come to their senses because God is willing to grant repentance to them. Right? Uh, are you following? Okay, so... Um, Okay, we're out of time here, so we'll we'll pause and we'll come back and continue with where we left off. All right, thanks, guys.